Hello and welcome to the Automation Village Breakout Sessions. I'm Dave Spencer and joining me today, we'll have guests doing three different presentations over the next three hours, where each presentation will begin roughly at the top of the hour. We present for about 40 minutes, then we'll do about 10 minutes of questions and we'll give you guys a 10 minute break in between sessions. So those are just kind of rough timelines. They'll probably float around a little bit, but uh, we'll try to keep it slightly to that schedule. So first up today, we've got Ian Smirchler from Dispel, who will be speaking about replacing your secure remote access system. So Ian, do I have you on the line there? You do indeed. Give me one moment. There we go. Yep. How are you doing today? I am doing very well in quarantine land. How are you doing? Yes, I am also doing very well. You can't quite tell where I am. I can no. guarantee I'm not actually, it's funny, no matter where I sit, this uh, this turbine always ends up right behind my head and I have these static people. I, I, I hope it's like this, but it never actually <laughs> works out that way. So it, it, it mirrors the image on me and uh, I, I don't know what you guys see, but uh, anyway, it always works out just not quite as I hope. <laughs> so anyway, so I'm glad to hear you're doing well. Um, right, so during your presentation, if anybody has questions, what they're going to do is they're going to enter their questions into uh, the Q&A box that they'll see in their little uh, Zoom window there. Um, they can put the questions in. Those questions are going to get queued up. I'll pay attention to what questions get queued. And then, like I say, it's around 40 minutes after the hour. Uh, we'll, you'll finish your presentation. We'll go in. We'll discuss some of the questions, some of the things people are asking, um, and sort of carry that through for a little bit. So whenever you're ready. I am ready. Give me one minute. Please tell me when you can see my screen. I've got you there. It looks perfect. All right, wonderful. Well, I'm going to hide my face. So hi, everyone. For those of you who I weren't attending the last event, uh, my name is Ian, president of Dispel, one of the founders. And the order of operations today, because we have a mix of people who did not come to the last talk and those who did, is the first people we're going to be talking about or, or talking to are people who are in operations, the second are people who are in management, and the third are people who are in IT, these things layer. So first, a three minute recap of what <laughs> was said before. The scene is a factory and what matters at that factory is uptime, availability, and safety. It's the same at any plant, utility, it's always the same, it's those three things. So our protagonist in this tale, that's our hero, is an operator, and the operator's job is to maximize uptime, availability, and safety once they've reached equipment. Now, the way they're valued, though, is not based upon how fast they do their job once they're connected to their equipment. It's how long everything takes. Now, when you're on site and you're using VT SCADA, this is not hard because you are already directly tied into the equipment. But if you are from a far away, at a far away location, it's not that simple. So in other words, what you're dealing with is not just the things that you can control. You're dealing with thing, ex extraneous factors that are impacting how you're perceived. The villain in this is the incremental step. And that can be flying to a job site. It can be driving to a job site. Or worst of all, it can be getting told to use remote access because for most people, remote access is just log in. The thing is when you're dealing with industrial control systems, it is very much not just log in. The typical connection experience for an operator, the operators on the left, the asset cluster is on the right, is as follows. The first thing they need to do is they VPN into the corporate network. Well, that's an incremental step. Then they need to go to a jump post on the corporate network. That's another incremental step. And then they need to go from that jump post to another jump post. That's another incremental step. And finally, they need to perform an RDP connection down to the asset cluster. That is another incremental step. Connecting securely to industrial control systems takes 12 to 15 minutes. This is madness. It's also wrong because people's time should matter. So our hero goes on a journey and they find a company called Dispel it has some faults, like letting engineers write presentations, but it's tested, trusted, and used by a whole lot of people. And the reason for that is they provide secure remote access in under 20 seconds to industrial control systems. 
the deployment time is about four hours, and it costs about $25,000 per year per facility. It's segmented, it's recorded, it's temporary, and it's reliable, which, along with a whole host of other things, means that it's perceived as secure by the IT department. And as a result, our hero hatches a plan to bring back one of these systems, prove its success, and start getting measured for what matters, uptime, availability, and safety. In other words, their job. So that was the recap. It took two minutes, 43 seconds. The way to think about the previous problem of this is taking 12 to 15 minutes to get into things is, well, from a dispel perspective, what's the deployment framework? Well, step one, you plug it in. What you're doing is you're finding the network switches through which the OT devices data passes. There will be a switch box somewhere in your building. If you don't know where it is, someone else in your structure will. If they don't, we will help find it. But if you're using VT SCADA, you have a switch already. Next thing you do is you plug in a Dispel Wicket ESI into that switch. An ESI stands for External Systems Integrator. Long story short is, is that it is a box that fits into a normal rack. And then you plug the other side of the Wicket Easy into the internet access point. And then you plug the Wicket ESI into electricity. Step two is that a Dispel employee will perform an asset inventory. That is when they find out that there is more than just the OT equipment that you thought was in the network on the network. And that's when you find there's also a fax machine, someone's iPhone, that teapot in the corner, all of those things. You review the asset inventory scan provided by Dispel, you select the devices you want people to actually be able to access, and then you define who, when, and why people can get that access. And step three is you start granting people access. Ta-da! No, in reality, that should be provoking most of you to have that look on your face. And the, the reason why we're able to describe it that way is the classic case of a difference between system and a component. So a good example of this for people who have VT SCADA is vendor access. So we have our asset on the right, and it on occasion catches fire. That's hard to do with a plate valve, but it still does. And meanwhile, you have your vendor who's off the screen on the left. Well, the vendor knows how to fix the asset. The vendor suggests perhaps using a VPN. We're going to set aside the idea of using things like UDP hole punching techniques, which people who will be speaking later today will explain are a bad idea. So they say, use a VPN. It's only $240 per year. From an operations perspective and from a management perspective, that makes a lot of sense. What then starts to happen, though, is all the ancillary components start being put in. In other words, a VPN is a component, not a full system. So you have your VPN trying to access the asset. Well, if the VPN needs to get, if you have a VPN, you have a receiver and a transmitter for that VPN. And because this is traversing the internet, you need an internet access point, which means you need a form of internet, which is costing you money. Then, because you realize that the vendor's computers might not be completely perfect, they might have malware on them, you want to protect your own assets from viruses spreading in from the vendor's systems. So you go and get yourself a layer seven firewall as a form of protection. Well, at this juncture, you also realize you need an authentication system to figure out who is trying to come in to access the asset at any juncture, you need usernames, passwords, and the like. And then you realize it might be a good idea to also track what's going on, who's trying to access systems and when. This would be a log system. And then you want to store that data so you get a storage system. And then you realize you really don't want someone going directly down to the asset because they might not have the right toolkits or they might press the wrong buttons. So what you do is you try to restrict their activity using a virtual desktop. Then you want to screen record what they're doing because quite, quite reasonably, it's nice to know when the vendor is actually performing work on the underlying asset. And then you need some hardware because all of this stuff does not run on thin air. Once that's all done, then comes the problem of, well, this is a lot of stuff. I ought to be able to manage this from a central location. And then someone reminds you that you also need to do regulatory reporting on top of this. It is for the reason, this picture, is the reason why there are people working hard every single day at your utilities to make sure that the IT systems work. And it should be making you look like this because someone told you that VPNs were only $240 a year. Time also should matter, and it's not that complicated to do remote access, or it shouldn't be. 
So people will suggest you just piggyback off the IT network. But IT and OT were very deliberately built so that they do not have data traversing the, the perimeter unless someone is very careful about how that traversal takes place. And as a result, this starts to happen. Jump hosts, for those who don't know, are literally allowing you to jump across networks. That's why they were given that name. So you need these bridges to get between the IT network, which you're VPNing into and has a lot of protective systems already in place, and then going back to the OT systems, which don't have a lot of infrastructure in front of them. So what Dispel is really doing is we're taking all of this and we're doing it on the back end. But from a user's point of view, it looks like this. So they punch in their email, they punch in their password, they hit the sign in button, they do multi-factor, authenticate, and bang, they're in their system. So that's a connection time for vendors of 12 seconds. Yes, in other words, you push a button. And the whole point of this is that it, it's the classic, do you build the system that has a, that you, where you lead off with the spec sheet, or do you build a system where you lead off with the fact that everyone can already use it? And in both cases, somewhere there is a spec sheet and somewhere there's a user interface. We just led with a different one. Now, for the network people in the room, which I assume are many of you, we're going to start with a network diagram. So what we have on the right here are the networks with assets. I'm going to assume that we're dealing with a facility, excuse me, a set of facilities. There's a single product control team. They are specialists in accessing these assets that are on the right. Let's presume for the moment that they are all valves regulated by the same brand of industrial control processor. Well, each one of these facilities has a firewall or gateway and it has an internet access point. Otherwise, you wouldn't be able to reach it right now unless you had direct lines down to them. For the purposes of this diagram, what we're going to do is we're going to crush this down to looking at one of these networks that we're trying to access. We've also abstracted away, for those of you trying to read the text, the idea of whether or not this is sitting inside of the OT network or it's sitting uh, excuse me, sitting inside of the IT network or sitting on a freestanding OT network. That will not matter for this discussion. So the first thing that's taking place is we're, we're putting the Wicked ESI on the outside of the pre-existing OT network security stack. This is because the Wicked ESI is where we drop things out of an encrypted state. So if you have a layer seven firewall and you wanna be doing your, your packet inspection, it's best to be doing that on unencrypted data. That's the reason why it's placed there. The Wicked ESI will act as the connection broker up to the remote access network that's going to be built. One point I'd like to make about the Wicked ESI is that the Wicked ESI holds user session level whitelisting on it. So if you don't want John to access more than one turbine, you're going to be able to specify it. So that's the only thing they're going to see inside of the perimeter. That Wicked ESI is driving a connection up to what we have branded an enclave. This is simply a moving target defense software defined wide area network, which is specified under NIST 800-160 volume two for cyber resiliency. This is a network of virtual machines whose constituent components shift over time. Tied to that enclave, depending upon the type of support that you need, is usually a set of cloud-based assets. So if, for example, you have Rockwell systems inside your perimeter, they usually have licenses which allow you to get access to maintenance packages, but those maintenance packages are staged on clouds that they control. The way you tie into those is through a virtual Wicked ESI, which is the exact same thing as Wicked ESI, but in a software form. For people who need to have extremely fast reaction times and have a lot of the same type of asset and perform the same job over and over again, we stage what are known as blanks. These are virtual machines of whatever size you may require that are tied directly to the Enclave backbone. Also attached to the Enclave will be a virtual desktop. This virtual desktop gets cycled every time it is used. The virtual desktop has preloaded onto it based upon the administrator's specifications, 
the applications that a given product controller will need to do their job. In other words, the people that work on Siemens equipment should be seeing environment workstations which only have Siemens applications on them, whereas the people who are working on Rockwell systems should only be seeing applications related to Rockwell. Virtual desktops can be skinned down so that it actually looks like you're just staring at a VT SCADA control plane. The way someone accesses these virtual desktops and the rest of the system is by going through a web portal, typically. This is called the console. The console is also where the administrators go to manage how these systems are deployed, how they are maintained, etc. The console is tied up to the authentication methodology that you have chosen to use. If you have Active Directory, we can tie back to that. If you have a PAM system that you'd like to use, we can tie back to that. Alternatively, we have our own systems that we can run for you. Meanwhile, it would sure be nice if you were able to track everything that anyone inside of your system, your, these systems was doing. And we do this at two layers. All of the network components within this speak syslog, and they tie back to your log system. We also have screen recording on the virtual desktops. So you see every action that they are performing whilst they are accessing assets. If you're doing training for a new employee, one thing I highly recommend is live streaming this. So that way you can have a partner watching on another screen exactly what the product control person is doing and providing feedback over the phone. If they see the person has gone haywire, they can blow up the entire system with the push of a button, but it provides a very responsive environment to see what's going on. If you have a security center, this data can be ported back down to that security team. We use something called a wicket uh, instead of a wicket ESI. This is a legacy term which we should change. But the important thing here is the idea that these networks, which are ephemeral, they only exist for as long as you need a remote access connection, are linked back to something which is permanent, namely your team, which is tracking what is going on in real time and keeping records for purposes of both accountability and regulatory reporting. Piece 10 of this is one that we strongly discourage when dealing with operational technology systems. However, is frequently used when you are dealing with company tablets, for example. So we have an application which can be installed onto a computer, onto a iPhone, onto your, tab your Android, it does not matter. The important thing is that that application can drive a direct connection from that device up through what we term an entry point. So this is a, a location thrown out close to the physical location of the product control person so that they get tied into the backbone quickly. And through this application, the device that you're on gets a direct connect all the way down to the underlying assets. The closest parallel to this would be using a VPN and the or a standard off the shelf VPN. The byproduct of this is that whatever problems may exist on the tablet will find their way all the way down to the security stack on the OT side of things. And unless the security stack catches it, uh, you're, you're in trouble. But it provides an exceptionally fast connection, sub three second login time. The way all of this is managed is through one of two options. Either we are staging an engine and managing this for you, Alternatively, what we do is we place an engine on your premises. So this is for, pe for those of you out there who have private data centers <clears throat> as part of your facilities and who really don't like the idea of sharing these launch engines with anybody else, that, that's the way to go. In which case, your experience is the same from an administrative point of view, but from a technological point of view, no one else knows where your engine is and no one else knows what you're building at any given point in time. Now, all of that took 18 minutes because there weren't many questions. So the next step on this is to do a test. So this is management's perspective. And what we're also doing here is we're trying out a different technique. So I would appreciate your feedback on this, whether or not uh, you uh, care for it from, a, from why you came to this talk. So, you have VT SCADA, 
which means if it's on fire, you should see it on your screen. The thing that's gliding fires is your chaos monkey. If you're in management, that's roughly what's going on because after you get the garbled messages on why there's a fire in your plant, that it boils down to chaos monkey. So your employee is given a hammer. We're gonna call him Bob. Bob's hammer will put out, will chase away the monkey and put out the fire. The first thing he has to do is go through a corporate network. Meanwhile, the monkey is still running around lighting another fire. Then that guy has to go through a jump post. Meanwhile, the chaos monkey carries on going. Then he has to go through another jump post. Chaos monkey's lighting yet more fires. And now he's on the SCADA system putting out fires, hopefully before the whole plant has a problem. The alternative with this spell can be simply summarized for people as he can go directly to the monkey, he can whack the monkey out of the way, and he can put out the fire. So that is the summary of what this spell does at both a granular level and at a high level. So thank you. And I will turn the floor over to questions from those of you in the audience. Thanks very much, Ian. That was great, I really appreciate that. And that summary at the end clarifies it all for <laughs> <laughs> so um yeah so just a few questions um the first one is uh what size operations do you guys um normally work with um with putting your system in so there the answer is uh several different tiers i presume that most of the people who are on this line are water utilities or associated therewith so the largest one would be the city of Las Vegas. In terms of complexity, that is certainly the largest. Uh, Connecticut Water has more distributed field systems. So from a how many boxes are out there, they have far more. But from a number of people being managed and how many people are actually managing it on a day-to-day -day basis is pretty narrow. And then on the complete other end of the spectrum, uh, the city of Brentwood in California has four people total who work on it every day and there's exactly one, uh, one box on site. So you see a, a meaningful spread in terms of scale. Right. And our, so I've got um, a question that says, um, just came in here. Uh, do you support solar system security? So yes, we do. Right. So pretty much industry agnostic. It, it is, it is. There are, it's industry agnostic. There is the feature of being able to automatically spit out regulatory reports, and that depends very much on the industry. And if we don't do a great deal of business in that industry yet, we probably aren't spitting, or there aren't clearly defined standard reporting requirements, we won't do that. But the core system, if there's an industrial control system that needs to be tied back to, we get that job done. Right, okay, cool. And um, do you normally get buy-in from both IT and OT, or can one or the other decide to um, implement your system? Or is it like if OT wants, I think the question is saying, is if OT wants to do it, do they need IT to be fully on board? Uh, no, they don't. Um, and to, so there's this concept of shadow IT where it, it's the reason why TeamViewer often finds itself in operational technology environments, which I think TeamViewer would also say is not a good idea. Uh, but the, the thing is that it, IT typically is perceived by OT as the group of people who are slowing things down. And they are, but with, for reasons, for good reasons. So what's unique about this is the pattern I've seen that's the most successful is we are either brought in by operational technology because they need a solution that's faster so they go and fetch one. And then once they've brought it in, they then take it over to the IT department and say, could you please vet this? The vetting process will take a few days to do. After that is done, then you go for a deployment and you see whether or not you like it. And then only then will you have the the ground operations teams looking at it and the crew chiefs say, yes, this is working. Then both sides are happy. The alternative, which has only happened a few times, is IT grabs this because they're looking for a cybersecurity solution and then they bring it over to the OT people. The reason being that this is fast and therefore and faster than the alternatives and as a result, people will use it rather than trying to circumvent the controls that are out there. 
Right. Okay, cool. Thanks. So another question just came in here. Uh, which protocols does your system prefer at the edge? In other words, you connect a cellular router at the edge. Should that be running IPsec or something else? Uh, we'll handle that. Uh, that that layer is part of what we're we're managing. Right. Uh, okay. Into, yeah. the The protocol, the industrial protocols, though, down in, on the site, we stay out of that. So right now, if you're able to reach them, you must have an IP and TCP IP translator on them or they themselves speak TCP IP. In either case, we're gonna sit after that. But once we've gotten to that point, the transit, we hold that, we deal with that. Right, very cool. All right, and I'll just give it another minute. Um, if you have a question, you should be seeing a slide there that shows you where you can enter uh, your Q&A in there. And uh, we'll just give it a minute to uh, wait to see if anything else comes in. Uh, I've got one here. Uh, oh. That came in from Amit. Any standard which you are following for security, in other words, IEC 62443? So the answer is uh, we map to a whole bunch of standards rather than just one. That's how we can be industry agnostic, relatively speaking. For those mappings, I'm afraid I can't recall off the top of my head the wit, what the URL is, but we have the mappings on our website. Right. Cool. Cool. No, that's, that's excellent. Um, yeah, I always, I really like uh, architecture. I should know, um, you know, that's, that's sort of one of the, one of the strong points where in the world I'm in is distributed architecture. And we talk a lot about, you know, uh, the balance too, because, you know, you mentioned team viewer and team viewer can be an easy tool. Um, but it's sort of like a VPN in a lot of ways that, um, if you just VPN into your system, then you're giving everybody, anybody who comes in there has access to everything, you know, mm -hmm. versus when you go in with a thin client or when you go into a more managed environment, you know, the, the thin client versus team viewer, I say, well, the thin client gives you access. It's sort of like if you go to a website, they don't say, well, here's the server, feel free to fire up the website. Um, right. Or look at the pages you want, right? It's sort of saying, no, this is the container that you're allowed to view. So yeah, having that, having that added level of management and looking at people coming in on the outside and saying, okay, you've got, you know, you're coming in from the outside to access this. So therefore that's what you're getting. And that only, um, I think that that's something that we'll see a lot more of. And they say, as I, it was neat to see how you guys take sort of an approach to that by containerizing, um, so much of your product actually inside the network. I didn't realize that you were doing it, um, sort of not just as a as an external but even sort of managing amongst the different groups and different areas inside of the WAN or whatever. So that was very cool. Thank you very much for having observed that. Yeah, it's yeah. it's a what I've noticed of late is that if you pick up the the request for comment for that defines IPsec for example, what happened with these things is people Someone had to go and take this 147 page document and say, all right, I got to explain this in five sentences. And they distilled down the whole problem solution set to this one holy grail term. And when you open up any of these, proto these procedures, you find that all the exceptions had to be built in because otherwise you would, the, the internet would just stop working. So for example, the idea of UDP hole punching being a good idea it makes a whole lot of sense for the video conference that we're right now having. But when you're dealing with OT systems, it has to be different. So containerization has been the logical path, containerization used loosely. So also just using a full hypervisor instead. But that whole path has been one I've seen a couple of people take. Right, cool. Um, I don't know if you saw a couple of questions just came in oh, there. Oh, sorry, no. Um, one from, um, one from Mark there. Um, I, th and I, it looks like Mark's looking to follow up with you. Um, so maybe at the end, I don't know if you want to put in a, a contact at the, uh, answer live there. Um, oh, with pleasure. Uh, so I'll, I'll read it out for everybody else. It says, uh, I compete with E1 and my customers say it's good because it's cheap, but then as complexity rises, they find the system isn't so good. Uh, I'd like to talk offline about how my hardware can work in your systems. And did you want to give that just kind of a very um, 
a very high level answer and sure. uh, then you can um, follow up with Mark a little bit more uh, sure. offline. The, the way to think about E1, uh, my guess is that we're dealing with a piece of hardware and it's also a VPN emitter. So the, that was the classic, that was a starting story where you say, oh yeah, I need a VPN. Okay, but a VPN needs a receiver, a transmitter, etc." So the question, the thing about E1, I like E1, by the way, uh, is you, you're just getting the VPN piece. And it works very well, very briefly on one particular assignment. So the question is, well, how do we, how do we build something that maintains the same level of complexity, sorry, that can accommodate system complexity, yet at the same time keep a low initial price? And the short answer is yes, please come talk to us. Uh, my email address is my first name at dispel.io. Right, fantastic. So, and then there's one last question here, and it says, uh, "Does your system support?" And I'm going to say this wrong, so I'll just say out the. Yes. You got it. Uh, so short answer is yes. The, there. Yes, the only way we're going to properly discuss that is is with a network diagram in front of us. But yes. Right. Okay. So for those of us who are perhaps slightly more simple. Uh, would you give, uh, <laughs> give me a quick description of what, uh, what SAML is? It, uh, it and a whole host of other things that are gonna be cropping up uh, is we have, whenever you're doing remote access, you're trying to bridge two different environments. And then whatever tools you're throwing in the middle, all you're doing is you're adjusting the manner in which you interact between these two environments. That bridge uh, used to just be jump hosts. That was what I was mentioning earlier. That bridge can be VPNs, it can be whatever. So the questions come down to, can you support me sending a particular, to, or interacting with this other network using any number of different means? And can you do it while also accommodating the wrappers that I've put on it over time? So these could be monitoring ones, these could be security ones. Any decent, system that provides a remote access bridge has to have come found a way to accommodate the this problem and the manner in which we do it is if you're using systems that need to do a direct link to work so if you've got machines for example talking to one another well a virtual desktop isn't really the right way to solve the problem the for those things, what we're doing is we're just providing, think of us as a pipe, you can throw anything through it. Conversely, if you're dealing with people who are trying to interact across systems and they have been trained to perceive the way in which they interact with the system in one manner, but in reality, that's just not how the machines work. Virtual desktops act as a translation medium where you can, on the back end, move the puppets around so that stuff actually works. That was the highest level answer I've ever given to that, but I think that that will, that does the job. Perfect. Right. Yeah. Fantastic. Cool. So, um, I didn't see any other questions come in. I don't know. You didn't get any, um, any that came in just to you there. I actually come to think of it. Did I, I did not. No, okay. Good perfect. So great job with your presentation. We really Thanks, appreciate sir. you guys um, or you joining us at the Automation Village at the trade show and also at this breakout session. So uh, like I said, it's all really interesting stuff. The trade show always goes, you know, it's an hour and it's going about 10,000 miles an hour. And I think it's still going 5,000 miles an hour for anybody else who's, who's watching. So it's nice to kind of slow things down and give you the chance to really, um, you know, talk about what's, um, how things really work um, as opposed to a little bit more of just the, you know, the uh, fact yeah. that you guys squash <laughs> these things easier than other people. Yeah. So, um, no, that was fantastic. I do really appreciate you coming on today and joining us. My pleasure. So um, for everybody watching the stream, uh, right now you're watching the cybersecurity and general automation stream. Um, if you would like, you can always move over to what's going on in oil and gas, water, wastewater. If you want to do that, the easiest thing to do is to um, go back to the invite that you have, drop off the stream first or this Zoom meeting first, and then, and then launch the other one. Um, but of course, we'd love it if you stayed on this stream because we've got some uh, great stuff coming up.
So in the water wastewater stream, uh, we would have uh, Mark Romers uh, with Filter Magic. And in the oil and gas stream, we'll have Mervyn Betts of Betts and Controls. And next up in this stream, the cybersecurity and general automation, we're going to have Tim Pilcher of SEL um, talking about uh, pump controllers for critical infrastructure. So we're going to take a break now. Um, I know we've got a, a good bit of time left. So if you want, feel free to jump over to one of the other streams, catch the end of one of the other presentations. But uh, please come back at the top of the hour and uh, join us for the presentation with Tim. All right, everybody, welcome back to the Automation Village Virtual Trade Show Breakout Sessions. Up next, we've got Tim Pilcher with uh, Schweitzer Engineering Laboratories, and Tim's going to be speaking to us about hardened pump controllers for critical infrastructure. So I'll give Tim a minute to uh, get online here. Tim, I think uh, you, may be, you may be live there, are you? I am. I'm, I'm out here. But can you hear Perfect. me? Perfect. Yep, I've got you loud and clear. So, Tim, did you want to introduce what you're talking about uh, just quickly? Um, and then I'll go over how people can uh, ask questions and a little introduction, and then I'll let you grab it and run. Great. Yeah, so I'm, I'm going to tell you guys, and first of all, Dave and VT Skata, I, I appreciate you guys inviting us and having us on and, and for running this very well and very smoothly. We've enjoyed being part of it. I'm going to talk to you a little bit about our hardened pump controller uh, and some changes that we've made to it over the last um, couple of years and, some, uh, and, and what it does now and talk a little bit for those who are not familiar with our company. I'll give a short introduction of what we do. Uh, we're a little bit new to water wastewater. Um, and so it, it, I just want to, I know there's some of those, some out there that don't know who we are at all. Right, fantastic. So while you guys are watching the presentation, you're going to see um, a little box. And if you have any questions at all, just click that little Q&A button there, type in your question. Um, and Tim's going to speak for roughly 40 minutes um, about his topic today. And at the end of that period, I'll triage some of those questions that were put in. Uh, we'll run through those with uh, Tim. And if you guys have anything, even at that time, you can type in new questions as they come up and we'll just go through those. So, um, and then you'll get a little bit of a break sort of after we finish that to the top of the hour. And at that point, we'll start our, our next and our, our last presentation. So they say, so right now we're in hour two, you're watching the um, cybersecurity and general automation stream. And uh, it's Tim Pilcher with uh, SEL um, coming up now to uh, talk to you guys about Hardened pump controllers. All right, thank you very much, Dave. So with me today also, I've got um, Max Ryan and Martin Lee are on the panel as well. They're from our R&D department and we're um, the, the, the folks that have been just getting closer and closer to our customers that are using this product to uh, continue to develop it. So I want to I want to introduce our company real quick. You know, if you've never heard of Schweitzer Engineering Labs, we go by SEL. We've been in business in the electric utility market for the last uh, 35 plus years, and we've built an organization around supporting critical infrastructure and providing technical support such that you can uh, get close to customers, figure out how to build products that they want to purchase that solves problems for them. And engineering is our middle name. We make a joke about that because that's who we are. We're a bunch of engineers. We've got over 5,000 employees. We're employee owned and we are here to solve problems, um, you know, with, with hardware solutions. And we design and manufacture all of our equipment in the United States, uh, which is a, it's a, a tough thing to do this, these days. And we do that a little bit uniquely uh, in that um, we also uh, take care of all of our equipment by providing a no cost um, uh, repair. Uh, we, we will repair and replace any, uh, any product that gets damaged um, with a 10 year warranty. But over 35 years, we, we don't charge to repair um, or uh, equipment that gets damaged. And so we support that product for the life of the product. And you as a customer get to choose what the life of that product is. And I'll tell some stories around that as we go through this. Um, but we've, we, uh, we focus on problem solving and staying close to customers. And one of the 
the, the ways that we developed this product, the 2411P, was by a request from a customer who had a who uh, you know was a municipality that had multiple services they provided uh, uh, for uh, for their customers like water, wastewater, gas, as well as electric power distribution. And so they they were looking for a rugged solution with the kind of um, uh, uh, long-term product um, uh, support that you can get from our products in the water wastewater industry. So they were a great partner of ours to help develop this product as well as other utilities that came alongside. And the way that we do that, we call it uh, understand, create, simplify. So as we get closer and closer and have more customers that are using different products, we continually simplify that. So that's what we'll be working on and we'll be, we'll be, we'll be working on that going forward. But I want to tell you about this product first and what makes it rugged. So the first thing is, you know, this is a class one div two hazardous location device. Uh, the hardware is not new. It's been, it's been out for, um, for over a decade. And what we did was we repurposed it and changed the part number from a 2411 to a 2411P and made it focused on a specific application. Um, so we, we will, I'll talk through some of that. So I'm, I'm excited about this product because this is the first product that we've made specifically for the water wastewater industry. There's other products that we make that are in the water wastewater industry for uh, motor protection, uh, power protection, high speed power automation and things like this. Um, but the, uh, but this one is made specifically for pumps. And um, that is our focus with this product, is to solve product problems with pump automation. So we focused on some specific applications with this product. Um, we focused on lift stations on the wastewater side, and we focused on water wells and tanks um, on, the, on the water side. And so um, we, we built this product to sit out in this environment, which is very harsh. You've got a lot of, um, you know, we have a lot of gases to deal with. We have a lot of uh, corrosive um, environment as well as a very tough environment for heat, humidity, and, and things like that. And our products normally reside in areas like this for 25 plus years. Uh, and so we know the hardware is made for this application. We feel like we can solve some problems with that. Um, it's made to be able to connect to uh, any of your SCADA infrastructure. Um, it's made to be a remote product, and so we have some specific uh, protocols that we like to use, like DNP3, that's made for remote um, communication. Uh, and I'll talk to you a little bit about why that's uniquely set up for remote applications. And then also, um, it supports Modbus out of the box as well. So when we got close to our customers to talk to them about what are we what are we trying to solve, what what are some problems that you have that we might be able to help you with, but we really talked about having a reliable product that you can trust is going to operate through these extreme situations and this difficult environment for a long period of time to avoid costly spills and overflows. But we also needed to have a product that was flexible and not a proprietary solution that customers could use with any SCADA system that they have. Uh, they could uh, mix and match it with existing controllers that they already have so that you can, you can integrate it in and do a a, uh, you know, try it out with having other, you know, uh, competitive products on the same system. Uh, and we, uh, they also were looking for having some field visibility uh, and also being able to have enough flexibility in the product that it's out of the box, it might be made to do this, but my application, even though it, it does the same thing at, at uh, you know, from one utility to the next, everybody kind of has a little bit of a custom spin on a lot of their um, applications. And so we wanted to make it configurable so that you could get in there and really customize it as well. Customers also complained a little bit about um, inefficient troubleshooting. And so having time stamped logging on the device allows you to be able to really quickly um, figure out what happened and how do we need to fix it? Because we don't want to guess. We want to know what the problem is. We want to fix it. So. Right now, the mean time between failure for this 2411 product, uh, the 2411P, is calculated at over 900 years. That means that if you had 900 pump controllers in your system, you could expect to see one fail per year. 
but you would not pay to have that product repair, um, repaired or replaced um, due to the damage. And how do we get to a 900 year mean time between failure? We test it. So we test it with, um, um, by um, uh, vibrating it, shocking it, hitting it um, with um, these, uh, these uh, ovens and, temper and temperature enclosures to ramp that temperature up and down to make sure that it's gonna be able to survive in these extreme um, situations and be able to do so at full operating capacity. This is not a storage rating, this is uh, fully operational, and we test beyond these limits. We certify it to this limit. And so um, we also make sure that our products um, for the pump controller, it's, uh, it's a pre-configured option to have it um, uh, conformally coded. Um, and so this uh, helps you to be able to avoid uh, premature failure due to salt spray, high humidity and moisture, those corrosive gases that you know are going to end up in your cabinet um, uh, at a lift station or at, at a water well um, uh, where, where you normally got those kinds of contaminants. And so this, this gives us um, a lot better um, uh, protection so that you don't, have, you don't have to deal with nuisance failures in the field. I like this statement because this is this is this is how we how we make sure that we don't have to deal with nuisance failures in the field, especially since you know we're going to take care of that product for the life of the product, and you get to choose what that life is. So we warranty the product for 10 years. I don't I'm a, I am a technical support person for 24 uh, SEL, and so when you call in and say, hey, this is what happened to the product, it's not working anymore. I'm only asking you questions to figure out how we need to fix it. Uh, and get it back as quickly as possible back into your system running. Uh, I'm not trying to figure out if it's under warranty or not. We don't even ask you know, for any of that, that is information. So we designed them to last for more than 20 years, and then after serving our customer for over 30 years, we do, do not charge for repairs regardless of what happened to the equipment. Um, I like this video. This just kind of gives you an idea of what does it look like when we test for vibration. So we put it on a vibe machine and we shake it and we do all kinds of stuff to it to make sure that this product is not going to fall apart and it's going to going to last for a long time. This is one of our other um, uh, power protection products on here right now. Another thing that we do is we we take our products and we hit it with a 15 kV gun. All right, and this is with the product powered up and functioning, and we're hitting it with this gun to make sure that all the grounding is done properly so that we're not gonna have nuisance failures due to transients. I know you guys probably don't have any voltage issues at all out there uh, in, the, in the field at, at these uh, remote locations, but if you do have transient problems and you've got voltage swings that are causing you premature failure on your electronics, um, we don't have those issues um, with our products because we test them and make sure that they're going to they're going to they're going to handle those types of situations. All right. So apart from being hardened, we want to make this product uh, feature rich, but also easy to use. And uh, um, so that's kind of the balancing act, right? You know, you make a product that has um, a lot of different things it can do, but you still want to make it easy for the target applications that you that you're you're shooting for. So it has some some really flexible I/O options uh, for the product, and I'll walk through those. Multiple communication protocols. These LEDs on the front of this device. Um, this is how it comes when it ships out, uh, and you can see it's set up to do a, a lift station for three pumps, uh, and you can see the level rising with these LEDs. Those are completely reprogrammable and you can change the labels out for different applications or if you don't wanna see those LEDs light up for those reasons, you can make them light up for different alarms uh, and you can really customize this product uh, beyond what it, it does out of the box. And oh, by the way, we don't charge for software. So the software is free um, and you can, you can get in there and um, download it from the website, call me for help uh, in, in learning how to use it and uh, we'll get on a WebEx and help you make it set up the way that you want it set up. We also are, uh, are going to talk through what an SER report is and uh, customizable event reports and show you some information around that as well and some data logging that we do 
to make it easy to keep up with what this product is doing. So let's look at the I.O. So the, the, there's a total of five slots. There's six slots on the on the device. We're skipping slot B because it's a communication slot. And we don't want to. We're not going to talk about that too much. But so you're seeing slot A, C, and D right here. This is the pre-configured I/O for um, this device, and you can see that you know you've got your float switches that you wire in right here to this high-density input card. Your intrusion detection comes in. Your UPS alarm and your three HOA switches. Um, are all going to come into this one card, and you can select the voltage for that card, whether it's a 24 volt DC, 125 volt. You can pick and choose what voltage that card uh, digital inputs are. Then you've got your pump control card here. The outputs are um, are high current outputs, um, so they uh, don't necessarily need an interposing relay to, um, on them. They can. And Martin, you're just going to have to correct me after I'm done with this if I say this wrong. But they can break 30 amps, and then they can make, I think, um, 6 amps, and then they uh, can do continuous, I think, around 3 amps. But uh, Martin will correct me in the, if, I, if I miss that spec a little bit. But we, we use those so that um, customers wouldn't have to have an additional an additional uh, interposing relay in the field that contributes to some nuisance failures. Uh, so we have less um, points of failure in the in the field. And then, of course, your pump runs can come in. You can select the input um, voltage for this card separately. I know a lot of times the pump digital status inputs can be 120 volts, and they can be different than the. So that's why we separated those two out. There's two more slots left um, to, that you can be um, creative with. And so if you need to uh, have a level transducer coming in and some analog inputs, you can put that card in slot Z. You can also put a four analog input, four analog output card in here if you need to drive a VFD or something like that. Um, and then there's also um, in slot E, you can do your own onboard phase monitoring. And I'm going to show you what that looks like. Um, so the, uh, we actually do power monitoring, and we also uh, sample the voltage coming into that cabinet at um, uh, four. Uh, I'm sorry, at uh, every four milliseconds, and so we can get a good look at how your voltage is and make decisions on whether or not your uh, voltage is sagging, swelling, you drop the phase, phase reversal, all of that um, uh, is pretty simple for us to do. And, and if you have that card selected to go into the 2411P, that logic is already pre-configured for you. Uh, and all you have to do is select the voltage. In fact, it's set up for um, a 230-volt um, system. And then if, you, if you've got 480, we just need you to put a PT in front of it and then um, select the correct voltage based on the PT rating. You can also add an additional 14DI card um, or other cards to this slot E um, as well if you need to uh, expand the I.O. and you don't want the phase monitoring card. So I had a video that I was going to show how to set how to set the product up from scratch, but um, it's it's a little jumpy over Zoom, so I'm gonna I'm gonna skip that. Um, but what we did was we developed the uh, interactive station settings configuration so that in the, in about four questions of answering is this a, what kind of station is this? How do you want to do your level control? How do you want to do your phase monitor um, um, uh, control for this station? And um, do you have a high and a low uh, float indicator? After you answer those questions, it automatically configures that device for your custom, um, your custom uh, application. Uh, loads in that settings file, and then it allows you to be able to go in and um, and pull those settings out if you want to customize them um, further or run with those settings right out of the box. Um, all those settings are documented in the instruction manual. Uh, we have free technical support 24-7 uh, emergency hotline um, and uh, and you'll get somebody like me on the phone to walk you through how to troubleshoot um, uh, uh, what's going on with that pump controller and, uh, and or to answer simple questions of how to customize your logic, uh, how to, um, you know, how to train other, um, other uh, technicians on, and how to troubleshoot in the field. And so 
what you get out of that logic is multiple modes of level sensing, whether it's a level transducer with backup floats, how many backup floats, one or two, all of that's selectable from those questions. Or if you just have floats, you can just select that. But the, the fault detection logic is already done, so if you lose a transducer, it'll automatically switch over to your floats. Uh, plain text alarms are already created for uh, that specific application. And then if you need to add additional alarms for other um, other parts of the other parts of the application that are custom, then uh, you can go in there and edit those as well. So the level control mode can be pump up or pump down selectable. Uh, like we said, it's analog level ready. Uh, the float switches are ready to go um, as well for up to six float switches um, out of the box. So if you've got a triplex, we include the high and the low float, as well as um, all the lag floats, the stop and the lead, um, uh, already uh, pre-configured for you. Uh, and then if, if you, you know, if you select that you only have a duplex, then we take out those other settings for those other floats, but they're still available if you need to make changes in the field. So we have extensive fault detection capabilities uh, in the product. Uh, loss of communication is a big one. So if you, it, it knows if your SCADA system is talking to it or not. And if you need to adjust um, what, how that application is operating based on whether or not it has a good connection to SCADA, you can use that indicator to uh, either put it into a different mode of operation uh, especially if you're doing a, a well and tank and you've lost communication to your tank, you can automatically put the well in a local mode to run off the pressure sensor at the header. Uh, and so you can use that information to, to uh, further make this a more dynamic automated controller. Uh, and we've, we've got plenty of uh, experience doing that and can show you some example settings of how we've done that. Um, of course, there's loss of flow, loss of level detection. Uh, an automatic failover to floats if you lose your level transducer that's already pre-configured. Um, we have also see, see people bringing in CT transducers into the analog input to determine if they've got a loss of load on a chemical feed pump or on, uh, on a, uh, on a uh, lift station pump. Uh, you can, you can uh, do that logic and then use this product as not only a pump controller, but also it can replace that RTU in the field that you've got for additional I.O. that the pump controller doesn't have enough space for. So we're seeing people put in our pump controller to replace RTUs and standalone pump controllers because it gives you that flexibility to do more than just uh, a simple pump control application. Local display of faults, uh, not only having the ability to speak to multiple SCADA masters through multiple protocols, but also be able to see stuff on the screen without having to pull up a um, without having to pull up a, um, a thin client on your on your phone. Although I love the thin client, not 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 against it at all, but just being able to see it right away on the on the display in plain text of what's going on with it is a big help to our customers as well. Uh, I already kind of went through the loss of comms and the loss of analog sensor stuff, kind of got ahead of myself, but I wanted to show you one of the things that we, we really push using a protocol called DNP3. Um, this is a, a protocol that's preferred in the electric utility industry, and it's because it's an event-based protocol. So part of that protocol um, it, um, it in the standard is it buffers the data and it adds a timestamp to every change event. And so the 2411P is creating that buffer of up to a thousand change events on the digital transitions and up to a hundred change events um, on the analog uh, um, uh, side of it. And so what you can see here is we have a communication loss that occurs right here. And this is from the, obviously, if you're a VT SCADA user, you recognize this graph. And so we have a loss of communication right here. And so we start buffering all this analog data until we fill up our buffer. And so um, this is on my simulator, and I'm running the simulator as fast as possible so that I can create a lot of data. And so once the analog buffer fills up, then you know it, you don't have any more buffering after that until you get um, until it unloads the buffer. But this is about 12 lift station cycles of, uh, uh, you know, after it rises one foot, it pumps it back down one foot. And this is a, a resolution of a third of a foot. And so you can have a communication loss for, you know, 
essentially several hours and still not overrun that analog buffer. The digital buffer is over a thousand and so you can have that pump station or that communication link down for potentially a couple of days and not overrun that buffer. You'll notice we didn't lose any digital data and I can still go back and troubleshoot every start and stop, every float tip, every analog virtual float um, change uh, in this to the millisecond is being recorded. So I think that's an important thing to, to, to know that you can, you can see all that data and VTSCADA gives us a great platform to be able to see that. Um, as well. So we talked a little bit about the configurability of the HMI already, but I wanted to show you what does it look like to interface with this product with our software and be able to see what's going on. So this is a motor report um, that comes out of the software, but all this data is also available through SCADA points for you customers to be able to see this historical data that's being tabulated in the 2411P. So, um, so you can see you know, uh, the, what the status of each pump is. Uh, you can see how many times it started in the last two, 24 and 48 hours. Total start count, each of those are resettable per pump um, uh, for short-term and long-term diagnostics. Um, and then you also get to see the level and the flow value right there on the screen. If you've got the uh, flow transmitter and a level transmitter, you can see that. And then these values change based on what's happening with those individual uh, pumps. Uh, and uh, the uh, text will change. So I got a snapshot of a couple of different text messages that pop up there. But this is just for field troubleshooting or remote troubleshooting. Um, if, uh, if you've got a connection remotely and you can get on and uh, with our, um, our software to, to do some interrogation of the device. Below this is an SDR report. And so you can see that the lead digital input, which is the lead float, you can see exactly when it tipped or when it uh, deasserted, which means that it, um, which it means it tipped uh, down, so the pump pumped it down, uh, and the float uh, went from a zero to a one. And you can also see the exact millisecond that that happened. So we're getting timestamps and time synchronization from your SCADA master over DNT or over NTP, um, whichever one is preferable, uh, and to make sure that this guy is synchronized with the rest of your system. And so you can easily troubleshoot it and, uh, in real time and see what's happening. And we store up to 512 digital changes on this SOE report. And it allows you to really go back in time and figure out, hey, did somebody push this button? Did somebody, you know, put it in hand? When did they put it in hand? How long did they leave it in hand? You know, what was happening to the switches or, you know, the floats and the level during that time frame? So it's great for troubleshooting and knowing what happened and not having to guess. And a lot of that information is going to be available in SCADA already, um, but here you can add um, up to 96 different digital points into this SER that you want to track, internal logic bits, uh, as well as uh, real-world I.O., uh, push buttons, all that other stuff, uh, and the push buttons on the actual device. So you can, that stuff you normally wouldn't push all the way back to SCADA because uh, you want to be considerate of how much data you're using over that connection. What does it look like to have a phase monitor on a pump controller? So this is um, a report from our pump controller where we had a significant voltage sag when the motor started up when it was on generator power. So what you can see is between this orange line and this pink line is 103 milliseconds. So we, we're, we're sampling very high speed. Each one of these little dots is a sample. And so we're getting about four, we're getting four samples per electrical cycle um, uh, with the pump controller with that voltage card in there. So we know what that waveform looks like. We can show you a picture of what that waveform looks like. And most likely the electric utility that is supplying power for this station. If you don't own that electric utility, you probably got our relays. They probably got our relays in, the, in their substation and their event reports will look exactly like this. And so it really gives you an apples to apples comparison on the quality of your power from the electrical supplier all the way to the, the, uh, the pump station um, where, where, this is, uh, where you're consuming that power and creating those voltage sags and seeing transients pop in there. We can record that so you can go back and take a look to see if you're getting a, a lot of transients at that location. Because I, I think what happens is if you think you have a voltage problem, 
you call the electric utility, they come out, they drop a dranite out at your station, they meter it for a couple of days or weeks, they don't see anything. Well, I mean, you know, whatever happened, you know, may, you know, may not be something that regularly happens. This is always monitoring and always collecting those events if it triggers off of, you know, a transient or anything like that. And you can set it up to do that. It's, it's very nice. Of course, all the digitals are trapped also. So if any digital changes, so I can see the, the auto selector switch has dropped out right here because the voltage dropped so low that we couldn't read that the auto um, uh, status on the digital input. So it's, it's a really neat concept to have something like that uh, in a $200 you know, uh, voltage monitoring card um, option on this product. So this is our, our warranty. Um, no questions asked, 10-year warranty. Um, uh, product hospital is going to respond within 72 hours of receiving your, your any equipment that has been damaged. And a lot of times we'll have it turned around and sent back to you. If it's just an I.O. card that got blown up by a lightning strike or a miswire um, or something like that, we don't even want it back. Uh, most times, unless you want full analysis done on that, we'll just send you another one. Uh, so, you know, if we can't fix it, we're going to replace the unit for free. We never charge to fix or repair anything. And that's, you know, that's the way we've been doing business for over 35 years. So we try to make this easy um of course you guys are going to be the ones to tell us if it's easy or not and the nice thing is, is we're going to be close to you we're going to we're going to we want to know those questions and uh and uh and what what's easy and what's not easy and and that's that's kind of what this is about is getting closer to you guys and figuring out what we can what we can do to continue to simplify this product and solve problems for you so um you know, we've, I've talked for a, uh, for a while. I know there's a bunch of questions out there. And so what I'd like to do is, um, if, if you guys are okay with it, I'd like to jump in and start answering some of those questions. Yeah, absolutely. Um, if you want, um, did you want me to, to read out some of the questions that are there? And uh, you can either decide to take it or um, triage it to one of your team members there. I, 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 Max and Martin, are you guys? Can y'all unmute and and uh, and jump in here too? And and uh, do y'all see the questions? Actually, I don't see any questions, but I'm right. on a web oh. um, application, so I'll read them out so that we can uh, get started with, uh, so everybody can sort of hear what's going on there. Um, yeah. So the first one is uh, a, f a friend of yours on the webinar who says, good evening, and how are you guys doing? Um, <laughs> next up was uh, a question that was just, how long has your product been on the market? Max, how long okay, has the so 2411 I, been out? Okay, so we, we basically had um, two releases, and our first release um, was in 2016. Um, and it was uh, not as full featured as what we just released at the end of um, 2019. So the, the second um, release, which is the one that we're um, I'm really, really quite proud of, um, has pump alternation. We added the pump statistics. So we basically put a lot of the pump control into, um, into the firmware. And then we also, um, um, added something that we call station settings where you can actually easily set up um, uh, about 80% of, of the configurations that, that people would have um, for a lift station or a, a, a water pump station. So, yes, yeah, so we've, we've been out since 2016 um, and uh, um, we are, are looking forward to, to serving the industry. Right, cool. Um, so the next question is, uh, what facilities on the east is this product installed in? And I, and I guess maybe we probably don't need all of them, but uh, if you have some yeah. uh, some that you guys know um, that you can speak of, then that would be great. Well, yeah, let me. Uh, so I've got a list, uh, Mr. Wills. I can provide you a list of um, customers that have um, agreed to be references. So Gainesville Regional Utilities um, is a reference for us. Um, Brunswick, um, Georgia, uh, Brunswick, Glen County is a reference for us as well. 
and uh, both of those are on the East Coast and have agreed to be references. There's other there's other utilities out there too, um, on the East Coast, uh, and um, that um, uh, are have obviously installed it. But there, I, I try not to give out any names unless I uh, we've agreed for them to be a reference. Okay. Um, and can I answer the next question? Why three pump controls only, and why not two or four? Yeah, I think that one came up twice there. So go ahead. Let me, let me, so, so what we did is we, you know, we, the hardware is kind of set, but when you go through the station settings, you select whether it's a single pump, a, a duplex, or a triplex. And if you look in the software, um, we already have, if you're still looking at my screen, we already have the ability to integrate in that fourth pump. And so all you got to do is, and we're writing an application guide for how do you add a fourth pump. Uh, the reason we stopped at um, three on the I.O. is you'll notice that our I.O. gets full um, on that uh, 14DI card uh, with the HOA switches there. So we'll have, we, we would add another uh, digital input card in the slot E to facilitate the fourth pump. Um, but yes, it, it, it can absolutely do four pumps. Um, uh, let's see here, where is the software retained? Uh, and does it require battery backup? So the 2411P has a little watch battery in there that uh, has a 10-year life. And in the uh, nine years that I've worked for SEL, I've never gotten a call on the battery um, failure. And so um, it, it's uh, backing up the software on the, uh, on the product in RAM. And so uh, that's where all the SER is backed up and, and all that stuff. So um, you don't, if you lose power to the product, it's got non-volatile memory. So it remembers exactly uh, what the state is of any of the internal logic. Uh, when it gets reboot, rebooted back up, uh, it's ready to go. And then that's selectable in the custom logic. You can determine if you want to use uh, if which it each variable if it if you want it to be volatile or non-volatile volatile meaning that it would not serve after it goes through a power cycle it would reset to something else uh, right. this product is designed for specific applications yes it is designed for um uh, a to be a pump controller but um what it is is it it's very flexible in that you have a ton of logic that you can ride it to do a bunch of other things too. And so we're, the more customers that talk to us about their particular applications, we're seeing the, the, we're seeing the standard application being a starting point. You know, you build in the settings file for doing level control and how many pumps that you have on this specific application. And then you upload that to, to this free software that you see on my screen and you begin customizing it from there and starting to move move the data around and, and changing the logic to uh, for your specific application. Right, okay. So do you facilitate per purchasing testing at customer site under actual operating right. uh, I suspect conditions? suspect that's pre-purchasing. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, it's, well, uh, per is what it says, but yes. Uh, Winston, you should give me a call. And, and uh, what we do is we have a loan, we have a loan um, uh, set up. So like we'll give you the product for 90 days um, for testing and then um, you can choose to purchase it or send it back. And so right. um, you can work with your specific um, uh, local support for that or you can give me a call, um, send me an email. Right, and uh, Tim, if if somebody wants to reach out to you guys, uh, do you have a live chat on your website, or is your contact information on your website, or how how should people find you if they want to reach out? Um, my contact is on the website under support for the southeast, um, but also on our website, which is selinc.com. Um, I'm gonna I'll just I'll just put in my contact information, see if I can. How about, did that show up for everybody to see? I put my email address in there, um, but um, on our website, there's also a contact um, in there as well uh, um, that you can contact our general support line and they'll route you to, to us. The nice thing about us too is that we have a, 
We have a technical support um, set up by over 100 application engineers that are on call. And then if you can't get a touch, in touch with one of us, we'll route you all the way into R&D um, and we'll make sure that somebody live answers your question, whether it's sales related or something else. Right. Um, can pump up on um, can pump on maintenance and pump fail be accommodated to facilitate the net? Yes, absolutely. So whenever it whenever it does a start fail, Winston, uh, if if it tries to start up a motor and it does not get feedback within a specific amount of time, if you look on my settings right now, pump one is waiting 30 seconds. If I don't see that the contactor has come in within 30 seconds, I'm going to automatically promote the next available pump to start up, and I'm going to disable that pump and alert you in SCADA that we have a fault on pump number one. Uh, the product does not support Profi bus or field bus protocol um, uh, at this time. Um, and any ideas on the sell you courses or training courses from David Grantham? Um, David, we are working on it, my friend. Um, we have uh, generated the agenda and are in the process of, uh, we've already got a pretty good handle on what the tasks are going to be for that class and we've got the um, the uh, simulators set up with all the selector switches so that the customers can play with the device and learn how it works uh, on site um, or come to a class where we're, we have a process we go through to validate all that stuff so it, it'll uh, but so stay tuned is, is what I would say and David Grantham also has uh, put them forth as a reference I think is what what they're what he's saying there yeah, CG, I think so JWC. Yeah. in South America we have an SEL office in South America and um, they would be glad to help um, help you guys um, with a pump controller as well um, so our product is a is a we, we make products internationally we're an, an international supplier of uh, these products so we make them for all kinds of systems whether it's 50 hertz or 60 hertz and so um, uh, I, if I can get you in touch with your local South America um, folks then we can uh, we can we can go from there but yes um, glad to help out please email me um, uh, and I can uh, loop you in directly to um, our folks that cover South America and it might sound it kind of odd to mention but our uh, products do also work on positive ground DC systems. So we do have experience in other countries. Right. Right. No, that's very good. Um, so I'm just going to uh, grab the screen from you here and uh, bring up the Q&A screen. Uh, just if there's anybody else there who's looking at um, Looking to put their question in, you can just click the Q&A button, type your question in, and then we'll get to it. And while we just give it a few minutes for other people to type in, um, I just wanted to, A, thank you guys very much for your presentation. Um, that was really interesting. And uh, it was really nice seeing some of your, uh, you know, the shock and vibe stuff that you're doing and all that kind of testing. It sort of took me back a little bit to when I was doing some military products. And uh, they do so much uh, testing to the, the mill uh, 810 spec. And uh, yeah, that, that vibration testing, even that video doesn't really put it into, or doesn't really do it justice. I mean, if you take something and shake it as hard as you can, it doesn't even scratch the surface of what that, that machine, those shakers could actually do to something. It's, uh, right. you know, they're, they're very vicious. Hey Dave, uh, th th this is Max Ryan from R&D. And first of all, you know, I'd like to express my gratitude for you guys having us here, but, but we do, um, we, we don't outsource our, 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 we shake them and bake them is what we always say, shake right. and bake. Yeah. Um, but, but we have all of our equipment here, you know, in Pullman. Oh, okay. And we, we, um, we tear the heck out of these things there. We actually have people that like to do this sort of thing. It, right. It's a lot of fun. So. Yeah. Yeah. No, I bet that's uh and I was looking at shaker. Um, they say, I guess just to kind of, give perspective, you don't know roughly how much that thing weighs. I mean, F equals MA and to keep the shaker from firing itself across the room when you shake something, um, those things, they must weigh three or four tons, do they? Um, yeah, I, I'm, I'm sure I don't know the exact specs, but in addition, we have our own RF chamber that's right. like three stories tall where, where oh. we actually um, test for RF, both you know conducted and radiated emissions. So. Right. 
Um, yep. it's, it, it's really cool. Yeah. Yeah. That was, that was really neat to see. So I, I really like that. And um, the, uh, I guess you guys talked a little bit about DMP3 protocol and that's something that uh, I think actually a, a lot of the world is just kind of uh, catching up to. DMP3 is a very, very cool protocol. Um, they kind of alluded to the fact that it can, it can store up a, an array of values and if it's buffers full, it's not like Modbus where you're waiting on a polling cycle and at that polling cycle, you know, you get a value or, you know, in certain sort of specialized cases, you may get an array of values, but uh, for the most part, you pull, you get the values um, for whatever was happening at that instance. Um, in DMB3, you've got your polling cycle. Um, so if, if things are filling up slowly, then you've got basically... I don't want to wait any longer than this before I get the values, but then I'll get all the values from the last poll to the next or to the current time. You know, if that, if that buffer fills up, then you're getting all of the values in that buffer. So the device itself is able to say either my buffer's full, here's the data, or it's able to say, hey, I've got a high priority alarm. Can I jump into the polling cycle and give you this information now? Um, and so they've got some really, really neat things in there. Um, so yeah, whenever I hear uh, DMP3, uh, I get get a little excited to hear you guys are using it because I do think it's an excellent protocol. Well, I, I'll let me chime in on that too. And if you're doing cellular data, it is a powerful protocol because you don't have you can set it up to be unsolicited, so you don't ever have to pull that station at all. The right. device will just let you know when there's a problem. Uh, and so we have some customers that are set up like that, or you can just pull it every, you know, five or 10 minutes um, if you haven't heard from it, just to check to make sure everything's still there. But yeah. the device is always knows whether it's connected or not, too. It's, yeah. it's, a, it's a powerful protocol yeah. to leverage. Yeah, and like you say, so then you don't have to wait for the polling cycle to find out there's alarms and other things. So those, those alarms are able to say, I've got an alarm, here it is, you know, right away, as opposed to waiting the... Um, 10, 20 minutes, whatever you're set up for. So, yeah, no, it, it, it's very cool. So, um, I guess, uh, again, I want to thank you guys for um, joining us and giving your presentation today. That was really great. Uh, it seems like a, a really nice piece of equipment. Um, I haven't seen any other questions come in. I don't. I, I saw a couple. Sorry. I saw one about. Ether, yep. I saw one about Ethernet IP. Oh, I got to keep scrolling and, and here, right? So, did you guys want to jump on and grab those? And yeah, I could answer that about Ethernet IP, and and the answer is, is that we don't. Um, we don't right now. It is it is a protocol we're considering? Right. Um, we actually have um, a, a, another. We um, in our company we develop products in tandem and know what other teams are doing. And we have, um, our, our, our team um, supports a product um, called the Arctic. Um, and we, our team just added Ethernet IP to that. And so right. we were, that was the first product that SEL had to do that. But in the 2411P, we, we do not yet. Um, although um, we, we, we have the, knowledge, the technical knowledge and it's something we're considering. Um, but one of the strengths of DNP, as as um, Tim was mentioning, um, on on private cellular networks, um, you can save money because you don't go into the implicit I/O mode where it can get very very chatty, you know, um, right. qu in quotes. And, and and so that's something that I, I'm interested in the application that Mr. Uh, um, Boren asked. Uh, right. Yeah. Um, would they might. Yeah. So that's the answer. Yeah, perfect. And it looks like the last two there are um, just kind of uh, happy customers, hats off to you guys type people um, with some information <laughs> what they've got there. So that's really great. Yep. Thank you. Yeah, definitely. Thanks for uh, we we we've been working with Brunswick for um, a couple of years now, and um, they've been great to work with and and uh, continue to teach us um, how to uh, improve the product. Right. Hey, thanks, um, Dave, for having us. Cool. Thanks very much. Um, so yeah, thank you very much. For anybody on the stream right now, they say we are one of um, one of a few streams, and uh, there's actually a, a typo in that slide there. So there's water, wastewater, oil, and gas, and there's the cybersecurity and general automation stream, which is the stream you guys are watching right now. If you want to change streams, uh, you've got your invite 
which will have all three streams in it. You can drop off of one stream and then from the invite, click the link to bring up the other stream. It's best that you drop off a stream before you start another one. Otherwise, uh, Zoom will often yell at you for trying to start two at once, but sometimes it kind of yells quietly and can be a little difficult to see. So where we are right now is we just finished our second presentation. Um, we'll be coming up to the third presentation next. And um, that's going to be um, on each of the different streams, the water and wastewater stream. We've got Ian Automation, who's going to be doing a case study on a VT SCADA upgrade in the oil and gas stream. We've got Quantum, who's talking about network connectivity concerns. And on the stream you're watching right now, the cybersecurity and general automation stream, we've got David Epsby from Jacobs talking about ICS cybersecurity concepts. So that presentation will be starting right at the top of the hour. So if you want, you can uh, jump off and try to catch one of the other streams. But basically, all the streams are going to go into a break period for roughly the next 10 minutes. So hang tight. Um, stay tuned. Uh, so Dave Epsby's got a really good presentation. And uh, so hopefully, we'll see you guys back at the top of the hour. All right, and welcome back to the Automation Village breakout sessions. Up next, we've got our hour three presentation, which is the final presentation of the day. And for that, we've got Dave Etsby with Jacobs, who will be speaking about ICS cybersecurity concepts. So during the presentation, and I'm going to sound like a broken record for those of you who've been here the whole time, but you're going to see a Q&A button down in the bottom. So as Dave's speaking, if you have a question, you can click the Q&A. That will pop up a window. Type in your question there. And roughly 40 minutes past the hour, we're going to start looking at the different questions. And Dave will kind of speak to each of those uh, with me. And we'll go through a little discussion about uh, everything that you guys are wondering during the presentation. So Dave, I've got you on the line there. Yep. Perfect. So yeah, whenever you're ready, Dave, uh, feel free to introduce your topic and grab the presentation and uh, take it away. All right, here we go. So my name is David Espy with Jacobs and uh, I am part of uh, the operational technology services team, the deputy direct director for that team at Jacobs. And, and what we focus on is uh, engineering and design uh, implementation uh, maintenance and support, as well as cybersecurity services for uh, operational technology within industrial control systems. My career spans about 25 years, with the last 12 focused solely on operational technology services. So, our knowledge goals today are to understand the current threats to critical infrastructure, industrial control systems, and then the human factor to cybersecurity. And we'll wrap that topic throughout our presentation today, the human factor in, in all aspects of ICS cybersecurity. And then we uh, want to understand the basic cybersecurity concepts for protecting an ICS. So let's go over the uh, current threat vectors. So this is kind of a, a short list of uh, the threats to ICS from a cyber perspective. Nation states are probably the biggest threat. Uh, nation states perform intentional attacks, uh, specifically on ICS. Uh, they're there to do recon entrenchment. Uh, some want to do intentional damage to an ICS uh, and potentially humans. And uh, some are out for ransom like uh, North Korea. Uh, there's also insider threats, and people really underestimate this this uh, area of a threat because uh, you know they, they trust their employees, they trust the insiders. But there's there's intentional and there's unintentional uh, insider threats. So the unintentional ones are are very concerning. Uh, the intentional ones, uh, yeah, you have rogue uh, people every once in a while. And we'll talk about that during the presentation. Uh, but when you do have an intentional insider uh, event. Uh, it's usually the most damaging. Uh, other threats, script kitties, uh, they're not intentional. Uh, they're not intentionally targeting ICS, but they can do damage. Malware or virus, uh, they can be non-intentional, uh, but there are some specific malwares uh, designed for an ICS environment, so they can be intentional as well. And then ransomware, 
usually it's uh, intentional but not targeted to an ICS. However, that is changing. Um, some are targeted specifically to ICS environments. And then uh, poorly designed systems uh, or poorly installed systems, shall we say, as well, uh, where you know passwords aren't changed, they're default passwords, things of that nature. And integrators, they are really targets of nation states. Uh, so they can be a threat to our ICS environment, especially if they're bringing in any kind of hardware or computers and connecting to our systems or uh, in just dealing with information about our systems. And we'll uh, touch on that a little later as well. This is a good example of uh, you know, an insider incident and uh, an information incident. This is uh, uh, the, uh, you may remember the false alarm for a North Korean missile coming to uh, Hawaii. And this was a news uh, clip after that incident and you can see a lot of information here. Uh, one is the password. That's obvious. That's a big one. Uh, you've got the, the employee's name badge right there. So you, you know who to spearfish. Um, you've got the, their operating system, their uh, browser they're using, uh, the version of Office they're using, uh, version of hardware. So there's, there's quite a bit of information that can be leaked uh, from an unintentional perspective that we need to be aware of. This is another one here. This is Super Bowl, and the, the caption down below is inside secret first of its kind command center, yet their uh, Wi Fi passwords posted right there. So, how do you control this type of information issue uh, in your environment? We'll talk about that when we start talking about uh, policies and procedures uh, to address the human factor to cybersecurity. This is just a, a slide to illustrate that. Really, this is headline news, right? Uh, things have, have uh, gained momentum uh, ever since the Stuxnet incident. And uh, all these attacks are really uh, quite broad. Um, there's a lot of nation states engaged in this type of, uh, let's call it warfare. So uh, it's something definitely to pay attention to. So who are the nation state actors in known hacking groups? This is just a very short list of them. Um, you know, we have Iran, Russia, North Korea, China, India. We could add the US, Israel, UK. Uh, just a ton of nations are involved now uh, in what I would call a war, a cyber war. And these are just some of the known groups. Uh, you can kind of tell by the names where they come from, like Panda, obviously that's China. Um, you can see that uh, there's entire military units dedicated to hacking. Um, Dragonfly, Energetic Bear, these are all Russian, um, Magic Kitten, Clever Kitten, Kitten Cobra, um, Viceroy Tiger, obviously that's India, um, and the Magic Kitten, Clever Kitten, that's all Iran. So these are just a, a, a snippet of the different uh, organized nation state sponsored groups out there that uh, are targeting industrial control systems worldwide. And these are uh, some of the techniques uh, that they use. And we'll talk a, a little bit about spear phishing because that's really um, the number one way systems, systems are compromised. You might remember this uh, phishing slide from our earlier presentation a few weeks ago, but uh, you know that's a generic phishing attempt. Uh, what we're talking about is spear phishing, a targeted attempt at a known individual uh, to compromise their system or their user credentials. And you can see how convincing uh, these emails are. Um, so spear phishing is, is something that we need to be aware of and, and uh, make our organization aware of all the employees, anybody that's even associated with an industrial control system environment should have cybersecurity awareness training to deal with this type of threat. And so, <laughs> This is a graphic that illustrates uh, two of the groups. These are the Russian groups, APT28. And APT stands for Advanced Persistent Threat. Um, they actually embrace the term. And this just shows how two of these organized state-sponsored groups uh, work in harmony to exfiltrate data from a system. APT28, they actually do the spear phishing. They install the malware, the, the toolkits uh, on the target systems. And then APT29, uh, they were the ones that, uh, or are the ones that exfiltrate data 
from the systems. So spear phishing really is the most common uh, entry mechanism to um, most uh, attacks. This is an, an older uh, headline about uh, Havex, but actually that campaign is still ongoing. And what's interesting about this one is that they actually installed um, or, or they hacked into websites of industrial control system manufacturers and poisoned their legitimate software downloads. So they, they put a new download out there that was uh, filled with malware and you went to the manufacturer's website, you download the, their software from their website, you think it's all good, yet it was already compromised. Uh, and that's why checking uh, the hashes of the files you're downloading, especially into an ICS environment, is incredibly critical um, because of this type of attack, and it's just becoming more common. Here's a few other headlines. This is actually last year, but uh, it says we're already in the middle of a cyber war, experts believe, and that, that is certainly the case. Um, Nation states have really ramped up uh, their programs, uh, the amount of uh, different groups and entities that uh, they sponsor to do it. And they're, they're doing it in so many different ways. I mean, you can look at this uh, one, this ransomware one uh, here is, you know, attacks that uh, were on companies with ICS. So, you know, it, it does affect the ICS and this was intentional. Uh, the Triton malware, that one, that one we'll talk about a little bit later too, but uh, uh, was targeting specifically uh, safety systems. So now you've got a human factor where you could actually injure people. I threw this slide in here for two reasons. One, it's a very recent incident, um, uh, attempted skate attack against water system. However, uh, I also wanted to highlight uh, ISACs, so information sharing and analysis centers. Every uh, sector has uh, an ISAC. This one was from the water ISAC. So uh, I would uh, recommend that uh, if you're not part of your sector's ISAC, uh, join it. You're gonna get uh, relevant, up-to-date information about the cyber threats out there um, and anything that can impact your, your sector from a cyber perspective. So let's talk a little bit about the tools that these nation states use um, to, <laughs> to do their work. This one is uh, a, a, an older one, but it was the uh, granddaddy of them all. It, it was quite uh, stealthy. Um, the only, <laughs> uh, they've only gotten snippets of the code from this, uh, developed by the NSA and its Five Eyes partners. Uh, it, it's a very prolific, uh, toolkit that was around for a very long time before being discovered. Uh, this one grew up out of that, Flame, uh, directed specifically, well, both at ICS and normal IT systems. Uh, but it's really less of a malware, more of a toolkit with a bunch of different modules. And the only reason it was discovered was because uh, there was data disappearing from networks and they found the, the wiper module that was wiping data. Um, and that's why we know about it. Shamoon, uh, you might remember the Saudi Ramco attack destroyed over 30,000 computers, uh, a huge incident, uh, obviously targeted malware to actually do damage uh, to systems. And then Stuxnet, we all remember Stuxnet. Um, you know, that's kind of started the, the buildup for the war, right? Uh, after Stuxnet, uh, many nations, not just Iran, but many nations ramped up their cyber programs uh, from an offensive and defensive perspective, but mostly offensive. And Iran, had they built a very sophisticated program uh, after the Stuxnet incident. And then we talked about Triton. So that targets Schneider Electric's triconic safety instrumented systems and uh, really is dangerous for human life, really. Uh, but real, and it showed also how um, how these systems can be uh, manipulated very easily. So uh, you know, it's a it's a dangerous malware, but really it was it was eye opening for a lot of people. You know, similar to Stuxnet in uh, the effect, but really targeted to, towards one manufacturer that's in a specific industry or a, a specific uh, niche 
uh, in a few industries. And then there's uh, Indestroyer. That was used in the uh, Ukraine power grid attack, obviously developed by Russian state hackers, but uh, uh, used in that attack, specific target towards ICS systems. And then there's other uh, threats. Uh, this is an interesting one, uh, that uh, this, this SCADA system was obviously connected to the internet and the company's financial system somehow. Um, and they made fraudulent financial transactions from the SCADA system. So I'm not sure why you would ever have that connection, but uh, uh, interesting thing. So if your SCADA system's connected to other systems, uh, it's something to be uh, cognizant of. So let's uh, revisit the human factor. So we talked about spear phishing campaigns. Um, then there's the unintentional introduction of malware into your systems. Employees uh, can bring in malware. Integrators are notorious uh, for bringing in malware. Um, infected software, where you're downloading legitimate software that like we talked about, but it's already infected. Um, then there's physical access, tailgating into systems um, where people can gain physical access to your network, network switches or uh, interfaces that they can uh, exploit. There's social engineering, you know, the, the traditional phone call from IT to get uh, your credentials or whatever. Um, really, the key is that everyone in an organization uh, adds to your cyber risk. And that means everyone in an organization plays a part in critical infrastructure cybersecurity. And I'm going to play a little video here, and I apologize if the video is choppy, the audio should be good, and that's really what's more important. We're talking about cybersecurity today and how safe people's passwords are. What is one of your online passwords currently? It is my dog's name and the year I graduated from high school. Oh, what kind of dog do you have? I have a Chihuahua Papillon. And what's its name? Jameson. Jameson. And where'd you go to school? Um, I went to school back in Greensburg, Pennsylvania. What school? Uh, Hempfield Area Senior High School. Oh, when did you graduate? In 2009. Oh, great. <laughs> it's like my cat's name and then just like a random number. Okay. Has you had this cat for a while? Yeah, she's my childhood pet. Aw. And what's her name? Her name is Jolie. Jolie. Mm -hmm. So like a password of yours would be Jolie and then a number. Yeah. Like number one? Uh, like my birthday. Oh, when is your birthday? Uh, June 12th. Oh, nice. And what year were you born? Uh, 95. Oh, great. Mm -hmm. So Jolie, 6, 12, 95. Yes. Got it. So you mean to give my password right now? No, I cannot do that. But we all want to know what it is so we can tell you if it's strong or not. Oh, my goodness. Um, um, let me think. Okay, one is Tel Aviv. Yeah. Four, six, eight, and then Israel. It's it's only three, but it's you know it's uh, for me it's strong enough. Ireland, one, two, three, four. Gemma, one, two, three. Spell G E M M A. Well, most of them are Italian. Oh, beautiful. Yeah. Like so what, like, like, what's a good Italian password? Uh, my grandma's name. What's your grandma's uh, name? Uh, Maria. Maria. So Maria is your password? Oh well, yeah, now you know my password. <laughs> oh yeah. So you can see how the uh, social engineering is a, a huge tool that's used to compromise systems and that's basically all the human factor. Another one here is, uh, uh, you know, intentional insider attacks and really those are the most damaging this incident was in uh, maruchi shire queensland australia um, the integrator uh, on the system after the you know they were wrapping up the contract applied for a position at the utility and was turned down and uh, took out revenge on the utility so he had insider knowledge of the system uh, he used uh, the, the software uh, that was from the project. He bought a radio off of eBay and basically was spilling sewage over a course of months. Uh, and finally, they, they tracked him down, but uh, a lot of damage done from this insider attack. So um, you can see as, as we're going through this presentation how much the human factor plays into cybersecurity. 
So to sum up, uh, in today's world, no ICS is safe from attacks. So don't underestimate the threats. Um, really make yourself aware of cybersecurity practices. Make sure you're doing cybersecurity awareness training specifically for an ICS environment. Ask for help. Know your resources. Uh, who can you go to for cyber help? Uh, avoid the human factor attack vectors and then, you know, really in general, build that security mindset, just like our safety mindset in organization. So let's talk about a cybersecurity program. So what do we mean by that? Well, uh, you know, it's the overall program that manages cybersecurity risk in an ICS environment. And these are some guidelines for non-regulated industries. Um, however, if you're in a regulated industry, you already have cybersecurity guidelines you have to follow. Um, but these are these are some standards that we can use. Uh, NIST, the NIST uh, standards. There's a whole series of the 800 special publication series. Uh, this 882 is the guide to industrial control system security. Very good, more generic, not as prescriptive. Uh, you have the ANSI ISA, more international flavor. Uh, standard, which is uh, a little bit more prescriptive than the NIST uh, guidelines. Um, but like I said, if, you, if you're regulated, you already have other standards you, you need to abide by. Uh, but really, cybersecurity in an organization has to be a top-down approach. It has to be sponsored by executives in the organization and pushed down. Uh, there has to be uh, communication from the exec executives down to the technical boots on the ground and then that needs to be communicated back up to the directors uh, because that's where you're going to identify your risk uh, to your system. So uh, that's one of the critical pieces of building a cybersecurity uh, program is knowing the risk of the system. What are your, your top risks? What do you need to focus on? Uh, so some priorities in, a, in building a program. Number one, uh, dealing with the human factor, right? ICS cybersecurity policies and procedures. That is key to dealing with the human factor uh, for cybersecurity, uh, things like information, how do you treat information. Uh, then there's physical security assessments. Uh, physical security plays a big part in cybersecurity. If I can gain access to a panel that doesn't have a intrusion alarm and, and plug into a switch, that's a big deal. Uh, what about walking into a, an open control room with a logged on HMI? So you gotta think about physical security as well. Then uh, building an ICS specific cybersecurity awareness training program is, is key as well. You, you got to educate people on these risk factors, these threats, and, and what they could see, what kind of you know, emails they may see in spear phishing campaigns. Uh, risk assessment, obviously, we talked about that already. Um, it's, it's a big piece of identifying uh, where you need to focus your efforts. Uh, asset inventory, if you don't know what you have on your network, uh, there's no way to know if you've got a rogue device or something that shouldn't be there. Uh, you're obviously not looking at your network traffic either. Uh, so that's a big deal is knowing what you have. Uh, technical security measures, uh, that's key. Obviously, that can help uh, with some of these human factor issues, but it's not going to solve all of them. Um, but it's a real key piece. Obviously, you can, you can make some great strides with technical security measures. And then obviously having business continuity and disaster recovery plans is really should be a priority as well in, in any program. So let's talk about uh, security control. Uh, what is a security control? This comes out of uh, your standard that you select, whatever standard your organization is gonna follow. Uh, and they should have security controls like this one. And this is from the NIST uh, publications here. And this one's talking about unsuccessful logon attempts. It says the information system enforces a limit of X consecutive and valid logon attempts by a user during a certain period of time. So uh, in an ICS environment, uh, this may not be possible, right? It enforces a limit. So how does it enforce the limit? Well, you could, you could automatically lock that account out, but in an ICS environment, you really can't do that. What if there's an issue with the process and the operator's freaking out and forgets his password? So you really can't lock the operator out. What you could do is modify this for an ICS environment and 
have it where the manager or supervisor is notified if there's a certain limit of uh, invalid login attempts reached. Uh, anyways, so this, this is the type of security controls and this one says the information system. That's a technical security control. Uh, an administrative security control deals with the human factor and that would say the organization does this uh, such as, you know, down here in the, in the text, you can see the organization defined time period, right? So, um, the security controls deal with both the technical and the human aspects. And this is how you build your policies and procedures around these things. This just highlights the cybersecurity maturity model. And obviously, you know, as you build your cybersecurity program, uh, the, the, human resources needed to manage that program go up. Uh, you need a technical expertise to be able to manage things. For instance, if you're putting in network monitoring in your system, uh, you have to have someone who actually can look at the, the information coming out of that system and know what it means to be able to respond to it. Then you have to have a team to be able to respond to those incidents when there is an incident. So I, obviously as you build your program, the cost goes up from a technical perspective as well as a human perspective. Uh, so something to be prepared for, uh, something the executives need to buy off on. All right, so let's get into our cybersecurity concepts. Uh, really the base concept in an ICS environment for cybersecurity is defense in depth. And this is where you layer on security around your most protected assets, you know, your, your, your PLCs, your PACs, you, you've got to protect those. You want to protect the process. Uh, so that's your most valuable asset. And you layer on security around it. And you can see the different levels here and, and the kind of um, security measures that you implement at each level. And it's really an old concept, right? Uh, if you think about a uh, medieval castle, you had your moat, you had your drawbridge, you had your wall with your guards on it, um, you had your gate at the wall. Uh, and your most precious asset, the princess, was right there in the middle in the castle. So it's a very old concept. It's a military concept. Uh, and it's good to think about layers of security as you're uh, developing your defenses in your ICS environment. So strategies for that are to build a proactive security model. You know, know what your security model is and abide by it. Uh, adopt standardized technical countermeasures for industrial control systems. Um, keep uh, abreast of security standards. Know what's out there, know what the, the threats are, know how the standards are changing, how you need to adjust your program to deal with the threat environment. Uh, use industry available tools and services. There's a lot of tools and services out there, There's a lot of them for free uh, from many governments. Uh, they can help assist in cybersecurity uh, program development or, you know, just checks of the systems. Uh, and continue building a robust uh, program. That's really key to a defense in depth uh, strategy. So we, <laughs> we, we touched on that, that uh, the information leak, the human factor of information leaks. You know, there's a few more pictures of passwords on news clips uh, that got out there. <laughs> so how do you uh, deal with that? Well, do you have policies in place that prevent displaying or sharing passwords? If you do, then you can limit this type of exposure. Do you have policies in place that uh, cover sensitive data handling? What do we mean by that? Well, uh, sensitive data is, you know, uh, your PLC code, your HMI files, your project files, diagrams, block diagrams, things of that nature, uh, information about your system. So your cybersecurity policies and procedures should include data classification to make sure you can identify sensitive data and inform staff on how to handle that type of data. In other words, you can't display it. You can't display a password. Uh, you can't share a password. You can't give out block diagrams. You can't email block diagrams around to vendors. Uh, you you got to do it in a more secure fashion. So you definitely need policies and procedures around that. And, and what about uh, integrators? How do we protect systems that are in development? Uh, do our integrators know and follow cybersecurity best practice? So during the system builds, when there are systems that they're building are in their labs, uh, are they built on shared networks with other projects that they're building? 
Um, are they interconnected with other networks or the internet? Uh, do they connect development laptops or, or systems to more than one project? Uh, do they install antivirus and malware uh, protection at the beginning of a system build? Are uh, software downloads and hashes checked for authenticity before they're installed on the system? And how do they deal with our, you know, data about our system, our block diagrams, network diagrams, uh, you know, PLC code? Uh, one of the big ones that I see quite often is the uh, system integrators like to use the same passwords on all of their projects, which is a huge issue. And some of those passwords never get changed, even after commissioning. So let's get into some uh, technical design concepts uh, for cybersecurity. You know, we talk about physical security. Uh, network segregation is a huge uh, uh, key to protecting your system. Demilitarized zones, uh, VLANs can help segregate your system as well. Uh, Active Directory integration, or let's just call it centralized authentication. Uh, Privilege access management is a good tool, and multi-factor authentication is a must. Uh, if there's any kind of uh, remote access to a system. And then uh, backups and disaster recovery. So these are concepts we're gonna go over here in the next few minutes. So from a physical perspective, we touched on this a little bit, but uh, we gotta physically secure our network equipment, our server equipment, our control rooms, PLCs. I mean, if our PLCs need to be in locked cabinets, you don't need people you know, from an insider perspective and just random people uh, that happen to be uh, going through the plant, could be a building uh, controls person or, or somebody that's not directly working uh, on your industrial control system environment. Maybe they're working on a different system that's not connected. However, they would have physical access to your cabinet if it's not locked. You need intrusion protection, intrusion alarms on those uh, cabinets as well. Uh, network segregation. So this is really one of the most effective concepts that you can apply uh, to an industrial control system to uh, help with cybersecurity. And so there's two things, segmentation and segregation. Segmentation is really uh, what you see here in the different zones. They're different network segments and all uh, chopped up by the firewall. Um, and then segment segregation we'll talk about in just a minute. Uh, and this illustration kind of highlights uh, the fact that we don't want to share physical equipment with uh, other uh, network segments. And we'll talk about why in just a minute here. But let's get into uh, the segregation piece. Um, so really, uh, you want separate physical devices. You never want to share a layer two switch with a business or enterprise network or any other network that's not your ICS. And you always have just a single possible connection to segment between zones. However, you can you see the VLANs here in the uh, green security zone, your ICS security zone. Um, that that is segregation. So you're you're taking that zone and you're chopping up even further, s segregating or uh, segmenting the um, the traffic that's actually uh, in that uh, one zone. Oops, I'm going the wrong way here. So this is why. So this is incident here illustrates why you want to do that segmentation and segregation. It's because um, in this case, uh, Davis Bessie Nuclear uh, Power Plant, they had an integrator working on the system. Now they had an actual uh, remote access uh, capabilities. However, um, they had also a back door where the integrator had a T1 line connected directly to the system. The integrator had the SQL slammer worm on their environment. It jumped to their layer two switches within their ICS network. That was a direct connection. And we'll talk about why that's a big deal uh, when we get into remote access, how you never want to allow direct connection between your ICS and any other network. So that SQL slammer worm overwhelms network switches, right? So the switches couldn't handle the traffic, shut down the plant network. Um, you know, it was a known ex exploit that could have been patched, but uh, hadn't been. So uh, 
there, there's several key factors to that. Whoops. Uh, one is that, um, you know, that direct network connection. But the second one is that, you know, the, the switches, if you think about it, if you're sharing your ICS environment with your business environment on the same layer two switches, and you get an incident, a worm, a poorly written worm is what this was, that overwhelmed networked, uh, network switches, um, and say your business traffic has the worm on it, your business network, but it's on the same physical switch as your SCADA network, once that happens, your SCADA network's gone, right? So anything that happens on the business network from that perspective could affect your SCADA network. That's why you the principle of complete physical separation uh, from a network devices, servers, all of that it is a key concept in defense in depth. So uh, you may say, well, you know, I don't, I don't have anything. I have an air gap system. We'll remember Mar Marucci Shire. That was an air gap system. However, insider threats uh, usurped that. Same with Stuxnet, right? That was an air gap system. It just doesn't work. I'm not saying that it's not a valid uh, layer to defense in depth. It could be. Uh, however, you can't rely on that solely for your cybersecurity. So let's talk about uh, the DMZ. Uh, so if you you know you don't have that air gap uh, and you need connectivity to other systems, uh, you have to do it through a demilitarized zone. And so, so what goes in there? Any in this guidance, in the NIST guidance, it talks about. Uh, any servers containing data from the ICS that need to be accessed from the corporate network are put on this segment. So if you're gonna exchange data with any other um, segment or zone, you have to have that data available in the DMZ. You never allow direct connection into your ICS. And you know, obviously antivirus servers, uh, patch servers, uh, and we'll say privileged access management servers, which is your remote access mechanism, go in the DMZ. So for remote access, um, this kind of highlights what we were talking about with that Davis Bessey incident. You know, you, you would never have someone log into your firewall and terminate that session directly on your engineering workstation down in your ICS security zone. Uh, the defense in depth approach is to have that session, anything from the outside terminate in the DMZ. Uh, and we always recommend using a privileged access management solution and multi-factor authentication. You can see that that multi-factor authentication VPN to the firewall. They log into your privileged access management solution or your jump box, uh, your, your remote desktop gateway, whatever it may be. And uh, that brokers uh, the connection. So you're only connected to that from the outside. And then it connects to the back end workstation or whatever your target you're trying to hit on a different port. So you want to make sure you enforce authentication of all users uh, seeking to gain access from the ICS network from other zones. You want to make sure you're logging and monitoring the traffic through your firewall using multi-factor authentication. Uh, you should always have a DMZ and then a gateway server, privileged access management solution, and uh, always avoid direct remote access to the ICS. Now, obviously, there's some environments, some ICS that are tiny. Uh, non-critical environments where you may have direct access. At a minimum, do your your firewall with your multi-factor uh, VPN. Uh, there are those those one-offs that you have to do that, but if it's a production system that's critical, you would never allow that remote access, that direct, I'm sorry, direct access to your ICS from a remote access session. <laughs> And VLANs, obviously, uh, VLANs are good for uh, controlling broadcast traffic. This is um, that uh, segregation we were talking about. Um, so VLANs can control traffic. They they keep that chatty windows traffic from talking, you know, to impacting your PLC traffic. Why is this important? Uh, the Brownells Ferry incident uh, kind of highlights that uh, this this failure happened because there was excessive traffic on the control system network. So the more you uh, VLAN off segment, you might might have heard the zone and conduit model um, where you have areas and cells. It's uh, that's a, a 
concept of basically breaking up the traffic. The more you do that, the less likely you're going to have an incident like this. Obviously, you want to block all communications. Really, if, if systems don't need to talk to each other, they shouldn't be able to talk to each other. That's the bottom line. Uh, you want to log and monitor all of your uh, network traffic um, for intrusion. Uh, you want to have intrusion detection. Um, and why is that? Well, this incident highlights that. This, this facility, basically, they had a uh, crack cyber team, but they weren't monitoring the building systems. So they were hacked through their building systems. They didn't know they were connected to the enterprise network. Um, why? <laughs> Why wasn't the, the cybersecurity team monitoring that? And some of you may cringe, you're like you don't want IT cybersecurity team monitoring your ICS. Um, but if that's where the expertise in the organization is from a cybersecurity perspective, funnel up your logs to them, uh, let them monitor it. Um, and this is another human factor, right? It's an organizational deficiency that had a gap in their monitoring of their systems. Obviously, we talked about uh, centralized authentication. It's very helpful. It's, you can disable accounts very quickly with centralized uh, authentication, uh, and you can control remote access easier, things of that nature. So a good concept for defense in depth. And there's application security where you can apply defense in depth. You know, you have your physical access to your workstations, your domain credentials, your user permissions, uh, you know, on the workstation itself, your HMI credentials, if you have different credentials for your HMI, and then your HMI user permissions. So you can really layer on security when you're talking about the application or HMI security. Backups and disaster recovery are crucial. I can't tell you how many systems I go to and they have zero backups. Um, it, it is really critical today with the, you know, threat vectors that we have or threats, uh, you know, out there from a cybersecurity perspective. It's uh, critical you have backups. You want to make sure you're backing up not only your servers and workstations, but your PLC code, HMI programs, um, anything that has a configuration should be backed up. You want to have a disaster recovery plan. That's in any um, cybersecurity guidance or standard, you're going to have this requirement, uh, disaster recovery. This is an incident that highlights why that's important. This, this system had no antivirus and no backups, and they had malware hit the system. It wasn't malware designed for an ICS, but yet it crippled their system. They had to go manually remove malware. It took a long time. They could have been back up in a matter of hours instead of days. And that's it. Now we can go to questions and answers. Perfect, thanks very much, I appreciate that. All right, so I thought that uh, that was really neat. The um, I say I've seen that uh, Hawaii site uh, photo a number of times. I hadn't seen a whole bunch of the others that you uh, that you showed there. That was neat. I was looking, trying to see sort of which organizations <laughs> it was for yeah, some right. of them. Um, but yeah, the Hawaii one. It, it's funny what jumps out at different people. The the big one that I noticed, even when they you know showed that on the news initially, I kind of took a step back and said they just showed all of their security cameras and the, you know, the location of where each is pointing. Right. Right. Um, but yeah, so anyway, there's all kinds of really great information there. Um, so I really appreciate you sharing that. Um, I, sorry, I'm just kind of queuing back to, um, to my slides here. Um, so for anybody who wants to enter a question, if you haven't entered anything already, um, there's a Q&A button there. You can put your question in there and uh, then Dave and I will go through that. So uh, you talked about things like uh, SSH, SHA hashes and, and things like that. And I just wanted to note for our VT SCADA users out there, um, you can request a uh, SHA hash of the VTSCADA installer if you want, and somebody can send that to you, and you can just run that and compare those. Um, also, if you're worried about giving your system integrator access to your network, um, and very rightfully so, 
Um, please consider using change sets to pass files. You basically go into the settings, create change set, and then you can just email a file back and forth as opposed to giving somebody access to a server to do something like a get from workstation or to just physically copy an application. Um, so Dave, uh, just a quick question about uh, password managers. So you talked about different types of credentials and I know it's very, very much um, sort of uh, different people have different thoughts on, you know, when it comes to passwords, whether you should be using, you know, passphrases, whether they should change every three months, whether they should, you know, different, different things like that. So I'll give you the, uh, the be all and end all. What are your thoughts on um, passwords and password management? If any, somebody had to pick a strategy. Uh, well, it depends on the organization, obviously, um, but uh, passphrases are obviously easier to remember and they're more complex from a password perspective. Uh, so from an operator, you know, notoriously they're forgetting their passwords. Uh, you know, the passphrase can work very well. Uh, one other method you could use is uh, going to a multi-factor authentication on your actual HMI workstations where you have a pin that the operator has to remember and then a token that they have to put in. So that, that limits what they have to remember, and then it's always changing. It's way more secure than a, than a password, uh, standalone password, because it's a one-time password used only once. Um, so there's, there's several strategies, but uh, in general, um, in an ICS environment, you, you, can't, you can't apply uh, the, the old IT, change your password every you know, 90 days or whatever uh, in most situations. Um, it, it puts the system at risk, it, you know, like I said, the operators forget their passwords or they try to rehash the same password in a different way. <laughs> so it's not as secure, right? Uh, so you've got to look at other, um, what we call a mitigating security control for, for that uh, threat or that, uh, um, that issue with password management. Um, it really, uh, what we've seen mostly work well uh, when you have to use passwords are passphrases. Right. Cool. And uh, what about, so password managers, yay or nay? Uh, password managers can be very effective if you choose the right one. Uh, make sure that <laughs> you're using one that's very reputable. The data is protected in a way that the, their systems are compromised. It's still encrypted. They can't get to the data. Um, or use an offline password, encrypted password management solution. Right. Uh, ab absolutely a, a good tool. Yeah, cool. Um, so a question here from Mark, um, and Mark says, as a hardware manufacturer taking security seriously, I've learned a number of customers balk at segmenting their networks. They also state that VLANs don't really protect them. Please comment on how you were counter this thinking. Yeah, we, we hear this quite a bit too. And usually it's it's from a point of, you know, they don't have the OT skill sets to manage a segmented network. That's why they're resistant to actually segment their network. However, you know, segmenting is one of the key concepts, uh, key cybersecurity concepts, and should be applied to all systems. Um, as far as VLANs, the VLANs can uh, protect your network uh, from attack in that it's it's breaking up the network into another layer right so you're adding a layer of security yes vlans if you have physical access to switches can be compromised yeah absolutely but it's that extra layer of security you're adding on so you wouldn't rely on that solely but it definitely adds a layer of security that can be valuable not only that but it adds <laughs> uh traffic uh, segmentation so you can segregate you know chatty traffic from critical traffic. And that's one of the key uh, concepts of uh, not only security, but resiliency in an ICS environment. Right. Perfect. Um, another question here. Uh, it says for ICS IEC 62443 standard, is there, um, it says for power smart grid where OT, IT both are there, what is the recommendation for adopting cybersecurity framework for power system. We need to balance, uh, it says CIA triad, and most of time availability was given more preference. Uh, your comment, please. I don't know if you're able to um, see the question there. Yeah, I can there. see that, yeah, yeah. 
Um, so yeah, 62443 is a pretty prescriptive um, standard to go by, and it can apply to both IT and OT. When you have that uh, convergence of IT, OT, you're, you're going to get um, overlapping standards. Really, on the IT side, you're going to have um, uh, things like ISO 27001 apply. And then on the OT side, you're going to use 62443. Well, those don't really combat each other. They can be, uh, they can coexist. Uh, so when you're uh, adopting the framework for that, what you can do is, uh, and what we recommend our clients do is take anything you can from IT. And when it doesn't really fit for your ICS environment, then you tweak it for an ICS environment. And that's an exception to the IT policies and procedures and the way they do things. So, and, and really communication and understanding uh, has to be there from an IT perspective about what you're mentioning here, the CIA tree ad, right? Um, IT has to understand that they cannot just blanket apply all their cybersecurity concepts to the ICS environment. There's got to be some adjustments made. Uh, but you can coexist uh, with IT and, and um, utilize, you know, the work that they've already done because they've been in the cybersecurity business a long time, whereas ICS is really in catch-up mode. Right. Yep, just had another one come in here. Uh, how do you balance convenience with security and convenience, uh, or and convenience customers to budget on, or convince customers to budget on ICS cybersecurity? Yeah, I mean the convenience argument goes out the window very quickly when you have a clear understanding of the threats out there, the environment. Um, if you have an, you know, if you look at you know, any of the slides we presented in the beginning, uh, look at the news, you're going to see that ICS are targets, uh, big targets of nation states. And maybe they're not uh, damaging your system right now, but they've got a foothold, right? So any, any manager with their, worth their salt is going to recognize that as a risk. And, you know, in their risk program, they're going to address that. Uh, so really, it's an education thing. You, you need to educate the customers on the threat environment uh, that exists. And that will allow them to uh, put the budget resources they need towards ICS cybersecurity. And one of the things I always tell my clients is really this, you know, cybersecurity is a marathon, not a sprint. Uh, you can take uh, small steps and, and basically increase your cybersecurity posture over time. Uh, but you have to, uh, you know, have the resources and the funding to, to do that. So. Yeah, it's critical. Perfect. All right. Um, that's that's all that we have for questions. So we'll just give it maybe just one more minute. If you have a last question, uh, feel free to put it in. In the meantime, I will um, try to provide a, <laughs> a made-up question. Um, now, when we're seeing... Um, different types of equipment kind of modernizing a little bit. I mean, back in the day, everything was running on its own network. It wasn't running on your, your regular sort of TCP IP or whatever network. It was, it was a little more isolated in its protocol and everything else. Um, now we're seeing a lot of those protocols being moved over to the, the regular network. Um, and we're just starting to see manufacturers now putting out things like, um, like a, a whitelist for which IP addresses can connect to a certain device or things like uh, running TLS between the devices. Um, and so, so what are your thoughts on TLS like inside of your LAN, like we're seeing with some OPC UA stuff um, where you know, cert management can be a little bit of a challenge in terms of setting up those certs and getting those certs on computers because they're not done through a, um, a known or a trusted service from the computer itself. Um, so any comment on sort of whitelisting IPs versus, um, I guess the two different things really, whitelisting IPs and I should say uh, using TLS internal? Yeah, so several comments. You know, um, you know whitelisting is a great uh, cybersecurity layer, right? Anything you can do to add another layer is great and whitelisting is effective. So uh, if you can do that, uh, when you're talking about whitelisting through, say, a firewall or something, um, and not an application whitelisting, uh, when you're whitelisting IPs, uh, obviously that's going through a, a more advanced 
uh, networking device. And you got to have the skill sets to manage that type of thing. As far as TLS within the environment, um, well, you brought up certificates, which is a huge issue uh, in an ICS environment if you do not manage those well and you don't have a team that's keeping track and managing those and those certificates expire. Uh, so it's really, it's a good security concept. It's, um, you know, can really protect your system well. However, you have to have the people and the skill sets to manage something like that. So in our experience, most of our clients aren't implementing uh, that type of thing down in the ICS uh, layer. They use mitigating security controls. However, some clients are moving to that and there's other technologies that are emerging uh, such as blockchain type technologies that uh, uh, really can, can help in that area. Right. Great. Thanks. So I think the last question is perhaps one for myself. It says, does VT SCADA support uh, two-factor authentication? And uh, the short answer is yes, it does. Um, for if you're interested in that, then I'd recommend you go to vtscada.com, go into the documentation and help files and look up um, the information on OpenID Connect. So you can read about some of the two-factor options there. Um, other people will do a, not really a two-factor, but they'll, they'll do it by putting in layers, as um, David sort of suggested, where you actually have to, to enter in in one or more layers. Um, to actually get access to the SCADA system um, web server to begin with. So um, I think that uh, rounds up all of the questions that we had. Uh, Dave, I'd really like to thank you for your time. And as that was the last presentation that we have today, of course, I want to thank uh, Ian and Tim as well for their great presentations. So for everybody who's online, you guys have been through uh, a lot of presentations today. I hope that you guys got a lot out of it. Please give us your feedback. Let us know uh, what you liked, areas that we could improve, and also let us know about the content that we're, that we're putting out there because of course, um, you know, it's a little bit of effort to put this on. So we wanna make sure that you guys are getting the most out of it. Um, as a final note, I wanna thank everybody and also, we really hope that you guys join us. Uh, we've got our Automation Village virtual trade show coming up on May 14th. Um, this is the one where it's really kind of rapid fire, uh, the presentations. So we'll have uh, maybe a dozen presentations as, along with some other content. And the presentations are going to be roughly 10 minutes each. Um, so, so it's much faster moving. Um, there's a lot being thrown at you and then portions of those will turn into breakout sessions where you can watch sort of an extended presentation on what you saw in the virtual trade show. So as I said, that's uh, coming up May 14th, uh, 10 a.m. to 1 p.m. Eastern. As always, it's uh, no cost. And this time we're going to shake things up a little bit. We're going to be coming to you live in Chicago and everywhere. So please join us for that. Um, you can visit our website, uh, get the link to register, much like you did for this one. So thank you, everybody. I uh, really appreciate you joining us today. Have a great day, and we'll see you in the next one.